What's going on my fellow rock and rollers? Don't forget to hit the bell notification icon to be notified every time I put out a new video on my channel. And I've talked a lot about the cult on my channel and I've done some videos on the doors, but one fan suggested I talk about the time Ian Asbury of the cult fronted the doors. It was in the early 2000s and the whole project was fraught with legal problems from the start. Stay tuned to find out what happened. The Cult would take a hiatus in 2002 following a less than stellar comeback that saw them release the record Beyond Good and Evil. It was the band's first record in seven years following their hiatus in 1994, and I've released a video on the Beyond Good and Evil time in the band. You can click the link in the description box to view it. It's actually one of my more popular videos, and it's a great story, so check it out. Ian Asbury would discover The Doors at age 10, and the Danny Sugarman book about the band titled No One Gets Out Here Alive, which would be a sort of bible to him. He would reveal in a 2003 interview, I probably first heard them when I was 9 or 10 on my parents' transistor radio. At the time, I loved David Bowie and T-Rex, but I was drawn to The Doors. They were so different, so much darker, he'd say. And Asbury was such a fan of The Doors, he almost got cast in Oliver Stone's biopic about the band in 1989, but the role went to Val Kilmer. That close call, though, got Asbury on the radar of the surviving members of the band. By the mid to late 90s, Asbury's world would fall apart. The cult had taken a hiatus as tensions with guitarist Billy Duffy reached new heights following the release of their commercially disappointing self-titled album in 1994. On top of that, his marriage at the time crumbled and he started abusing alcohol and was still reeling from a $61 million lawsuit brought by the family of a young American Indian boy who had claimed his image had been used on the album cover of the cult's 1991 record ceremony without permission. Side note, I also did a video on that lawsuit and album and the links are down below. And Asbury would find sanctuary in a spiritual trip to Tibet and a trip to the island of Cuba. And when he returned home, he would leave his wife and went to therapy. He would reveal, I made big breakthroughs in therapy in 1998. That was my big clear out year, he'd remember. And the following year, Asbury's involvement with the surviving members of The Doors got started as he joined The Doors guitarist Robbie Krieger during one of his solo gigs. The Doors surviving members would reunite in 2000 to perform on the VH1 Storytellers TV show. For the live performance, the band was joined by Angelo Barbara and numerous guest vocalists including Ian Asbury, Scott Weiland, Scott Stapp, Perry Farrell, Pat Monahan, and Travis Meeks. And by 2002, The Doors were ready to hit the road with Asbury fronting the band. The reunited lineup plus Asprey would call themselves the Doors of the 21st Century, and surviving drummer John Densmore wasn't able to be part of the reunion as his bandmates claimed he was suffering from a hearing condition known as tinnitus and would be replaced by the police's drummer Stuart Copeland. But Densmore contended by the time the tour started he had recovered fully and that he was fired by the band after reading an article in Billboard magazine saying, I thought, oh okay, I'm fired in the paper. I called Robbie and said, Robbie, you've got to change the name, please. And Densmore was frustrated by the band's arrangement saying, I'm troubled by one guy singing the whole night. There are Doors cover bands in every city and we shouldn't join that, should we? No disrespect to Ian Asbury or Stuart Copeland, they're wonderful musicians, but my point is they are not the Doors. Densmore also complained about the phrase of the 21st century as it was little more than fine print in advertisements and that the new band displayed Morrison's image dozens of times during concerts. And Copeland would be forced to withdraw from touring after he broke his arm following a biking accident and he would be replaced by Ty Dennis, who played in Krieger's solo band. Interestingly, Asprey wasn't the band's first choice to replace Jim Morrison on stage. Following his passing, the surviving members had talks with Joe Cocker and audience singer Howard Wirth, but neither came to fruition. And the Doors would play together again in 1993 as their induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, with Pearl Jam singer Eddie Vedder fronting the band. And as the Doors of the 21st century hit the road, they were slapped with lawsuit after lawsuit. In April of 2003, it was reported that Jim Morrison's parents had filed a lawsuit against the surviving members of The Doors, and even Ian Asbury for misappropriating the band's name, claiming it isn't The Doors without their son. Also involved in the lawsuit were the parents of Morrison's girlfriend, Pamela Corson, who claimed she owned half of Morrison's share on The Doors. And to make matters worse, in 2003, the band was hit with another lawsuit by original drummer John Densmore. Densmore's suit, which seeked unspecified damages, claimed that written and oral agreements mandate that the Doors name and logo can only be used by original band members and that Doors of the 21st Century and the Doors logo for Asbury's collaboration was a violation of the band's agreement. 
The lawsuits didn't end there, as Stuart Copeland filed his own lawsuit, as well as claiming he was dismissed without reason and not paid money owed to him, which amounted to about a million dollars. Copeland's lawsuit would be settled out of court in 2003. And the Densmore lawsuit stemmed from a 1970 agreement signed by the four original band members, including Morrison, that any business deal would require a unanimous vote of the Doors. The agreement was reached after Morrison and the other three members got into a violent disagreement over using Light My Fire in a Buick television commercial. And while the three partners had initially agreed to the commercial, Morrison vehemently disagreed and the commercial was not done. And since Morrison's death in Paris in 1971, the remaining band members and the parents split Morrison's share of the Doors music and memorabilia, and each partner has video power over business deals. And it was during the 90s that General Motors offered the partnership $15 million to use Light My Fire to sell Cadillacs, and everyone but Densmore wanted to take the deal, but he refused. And Densmore also refused an endorsement deal offered by iPod maker Apple. And in 2007, Asbury would quit the Doors and reform the cult again, and the following year the surviving members of the Doors would announce a new project titled Riders on the Storm. The band featured two original members of the Doors and recruited a new singer, Brett Scallions, formerly of the band Fuel, who would front the band. The tour with Asbury would gross more than $8 million and net $3.2 million, which went to the new band's company called Doors Touring Incorporated, none of which went to Densmore or the parents of Jim Morrison or his girlfriend. And in 2008, the legal battle finally came to an end as the California Supreme Court refused to take up the case. What did this mean? Well, keyboardist Ray Manzurek and Robbie Krieger were on the hook for more than $5 million after lower courts found them to have improperly invoked the Doors name and images during a 2003 concert tour. The $5 million settlement would end up being split by drummer John Densmore, the parents of Jim Morrison, and the parents of his deceased wife Pamela Corson, who died in 1974. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. If you have suggestions for future topics, let me know in the comment section below. Take care.